Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 108 Written by Pepper Antique James woke up later that morning in his bed. He didn't remember getting there, so he figured Amina must have carried him. She was strong enough to do so, he knew. She was wrapped around him, with his head resting on her chest. He moved his arms around her and held her tightly, remembering the tear-laden conversation from the night before. He stayed that way for a while. At least until she woke up some time later, yawning as she pulled him in tighter. Go od morning. She said as she finished yawning. She stretched her arms out behind him, shaking the hand of the arm that had been under his head. Morning. He said. He kissed her collarbone. Thank you. For what? She asked as she rubbed her eyes. For last night. She wrapped her arms around him again, squeezing lightly. Of course. She replied. Now let's get up and find some breakfast. I'm about five different kinds of sore from last night. He held her like that for just a moment longer, then they both got up and dressed for the day. Before he put his boots on he pulled out his phone and the drone control tablet, and sent a short message back to the other side. He still felt bad about his newfound wealth. But he felt better. When they stepped out of the yurt, it was snowing lightly. The flakes were large and fluffy, and they melted almost as soon as they hit the ground. But the effect was still impressive. The fat, soft, snowflakes drifting lazily to the ground in a city of yurts and dragons. Even though it reminded James of how foreign his setting was, he couldn't help but enjoy the visual. He craned his head back at an angle and stuck out his tongue. Oh James! It's gorgeous! Amina said as she caught one of the flakes on the sleeve of her coat. She turned and saw the position he was in. What are you dash? James held up a finger, moved his head to the side a bit, and caught one of the large flakes on his tongue. He looked at her with a large, dumb, smile on his face. She chuckled. What are you doing? She asked. What? He asked. You've never caught snowflakes on your tongue? She tried not to laugh. Not since I was a little kid. She admitted. He smiled, then craned his head back. Nobody is too old to catch a snowflake. He said, before sticking his tongue back out and snatching another one out of the air. Amina began full on laughing at the sight. Then James began running after her, tongue still out. You gotta catch a snuffleck. He yelled past his protruding tongue as she jogged away from him, cackling as she did. His neighbors, few as they were, watched the young lovers with amusement. Though, a few of them did stick their tongues out too. All right everyone. General Crick said to the control room. How's our party doing? He stood in front of the observation window, looking down at the five people who were set to travel to the other side. Prep is done sir. Door ready to open up at your command. A tech said from behind him. The general waved at the people down below, then held a thumb up for them to see. Several of them were busy checking each other's packs. But two of them saw the questioning signal, turned to talk to the others, and then a moment later a bunch of thumbs went up in response. All right. We got thumbs up. He said as he turned around. Go ahead and ring the bell. He turned back around and gave a little half a salute to the group as the lights changed to red. The familiar sparking circle began to flicker to life. Secondary reactor kicking on. Another tech said. Levels are good. No draw over this time. We're green sir. The sub shouldn't even be needed. Good. He replied. Below him the door finally stabilized in its usual position a few inches off the ground. The leader of the party, Master Sergeant Nguyen, gave him one last thumbs up. The general returned it, and the MSG picked up the two cases next to him, and stepped through. The other four followed quickly after. Ah, and all members have translated. Are we a go for the test, sir? He watched for a moment, then turned back. Do it, he said. Then he quickly turned back to the window. He needed to see this. It took a moment, but several small objects were pushed through, for in total. That was all they had to send on this attempt, sir. 
shut it down. He replied. Below him the circle began to flicker again, then after a few moments it disappeared entirely. The lights flicked back from red, to their normal white. Numerous technicians in hazmat suits quickly moved forward and retrieved the two cages, a small wooden box, and one clear container. They waved numerous devices over them, scanning for radiation, toxins, foreign elements, anything that might be hazardous. As soon as the devices gave them the green light they lifted the containers and put them into clear plexiglass boxes and sealed them in. But the head of the team looked up at the control room as they were wheeled away, and shook their head. Damn. He thought. Another tech piped up. We've got a bowl with several fish, two birds, and one small mammal sir. Plus a package of non-biological material. Initial reports are that none of them survived the transit. Further testing required. They paused. He stood there thinking for a moment. Well. He started. We've got a somewhat successful return trip. Our friend on the other side, and Captain Choi warned us that nothing would survive it. He paused. This just confirmed. The bio team is doing standard resuscitation procedures on the critters? He asked the tech who'd given the report. Yes sir. Vets are doing what they can. They replied. All right. Well, fingers crossed that some of them get back up. Give me reports as soon as we get M. He said as he began walking out. As he did he passed the colonel, who fell into step behind him. At least they came through. She said. He didn't reply. Captain Choi sent us another message. What about? He asked as he fished out his pack of smokes. He was wondering when we'd be able to put him in contact with his family, if at all. Also some financial concerns. Financial concerns? The general asked as he put a smoke in the corner of his mouth. The guy's in a different world. What's he got to worry about? His family sir. She replied, for once not sounding cold about the matter. He wanted to know if he could have his pay rerouted to his mother. The general stopped in his tracks, cigarette still not lit. Were we not already doing that part? He asked. I don't believe so sir. She admitted. He lit the cigarette as he resumed walking. Just make it happen. Captain's pay, hazard pay, all that stuff. I already know the poor woman's worried. It's the least we can do. Yes sir. She answered. And letting them talk sir? She asked. He sighed, exhaling the minty smoke he'd pulled in. A, hey, we were gonna have to do that eventually. After all, the kid ain't dead or anything, much as he tries to be sometimes. He took another drag as they stepped into his office. Have the legal people come up with a couple of NDAs and double-check the mom for security clearance purposes. We'll have to sit down and talk to her face to face before we tell her anything too in depth. But she should have some kind of idea of what's going on. He sat down in his chair and gestured for her to sit. Is that a good idea sir? She asked, though the tone was more curious than anything. Probably not. But I promised Choi that I'd do what I could to get him in touch with them. I'm a man of my word. He said as he pulled up the feed to the room where the techs were inspecting the animals and materials they'd received. He puffed out more smoke. In the meantime, we'll send Choi instructions to record a message for her. No visuals, just audio. Give him the rules on what he can and cannot say. Then we'll check it and if it's good, show it to her. He zoomed in on one of the cameras and looked at one of the dead creatures, it looked like a cross between a hedgehog and a lizard. What the fuck is that? He asked, turning the screen for her to see. Her eyebrows raised a bit and she tilted her head. Alien life? She wondered. Is it considered alien if it's from a different dimension? He asked. That's a question for the scientists. She replied. Looks alien to me though. Fucking hedgeguana or some shit. He said with a chuckle. I'll let the vets know that we have an official designation for it sir. She said with a wry grin. He let out a quick chuckle, thick with minty smoke. 
Don't be a smart-ass colonel. His tone let her know he was joking. Get started on Choi's financial stuff. I'll work with legal on getting his mother in the loop. He said. She nodded and was about to get up and walk out when he spoke up again. You almost don't seem mad at him about wanting to give his pay to his mom. The general said, more a statement than a question. She paused. I can. Understand his concern. She said finally. I've been there. Turns out he's human just like the rest of us. The general said simply. Then he turned back to his computer and began typing. She took that as the sign to leave. King Farik stood in the castle's healing ward talking to the chief healing mage, a tall yet well-bearded elf named Sinlo. The ward was mostly empty, with only a few soldiers complaining of sprains and bruises, and some castle staff with other minor issues. So you're saying that the texts that the heroes people sent over have been a help? He asked Sinlo. Very much so. The elf replied. We've only applied a small portion of the knowledge so far. Mainly some of the understanding of how veins and arteries work and where they're located. Also only to humans, since that's what their books are written for. But some of our researchers have been working on translating the knowledge to the other races whose physiology is similar enough that the same principles might apply. The king's eyes widened a bit as the tall man spoke. After a moment he had to interrupt. What kind of change have we seen? He asked. Oh. The elf said as he realized that he'd been confusing the king a bit. Well, we applied some of the methods that the books had on some of the victims of that brawl in the Copper District a few days ago. We were able to save some of the injured from wounds that would have likely resulted in amputations, maybe even death. He pulled a small notebook from the desk they were standing by and quickly flipped to an already marked page. Having seen injuries like these before, from other brawls, battles, fighting tournaments. I'd say we probably saved twice as many people, and prevented far more permanently crippling injuries. He said after a moment. All that just from one part of the knowledge they sent. The king asked, amazed at the result. All that from a single. Intervention, is the term they called it. Just a simple device that they use for traumatic injuries. He said. The elf walked to one of the bags they sent out with traveling healers when there were reports of injuries in the city. He pulled out a leather strap that had a metal ring, a clasp, and a section of metal bar on it. King Farik recognized it immediately as being nearly identical to the device James had used to help Artair survive being shot in the leg. This? He asked, holding the small device. Yes sir. Archmage Marcos had several dozen of them made by the royal craftsman. We've been using them for two weeks now, and the results are already incredible. He looked in his notebook again. Injuries that would typically be fatal are now proving less so. People are actually surviving long enough to get to a proper healing facility where they can be stabilized. Just because of these things. Incredible. The king said, still looking at the small leather and metal device. What else have you managed to learn and apply? He asked. Sinlo smiled. Please your highness, write this way. We've started to delve into the section about infectious disease. The healers of earth have these incredible things called antibiotics. The two of them began walking towards a different part of the ward.